Hello. We're going to talk about the spread of Christianity. This is Unit 8, Section 2. So, in the 300s, most Christians lived right along the Mediterranean. Let me show you. Let's go with map world. Here's a, oh, come on. Give me a better map. Here we are. Okay, here's the Mediterranean Sea. And most Christians in the 300s lived in this little area right here along the sea. This was pretty much in between the sea and my line. They didn't really live up here and they didn't even live in the middle of Italy. Just right along the sea is where most of the Christians lived. And also in the Middle Ages, you have to remember in Western, the Western Roman Empire, society has completely collapsed. Education is gone. Fancy houses are gone. Plumbing is gone. People have gone back very, into a very primitive lifestyle. And some people latched onto their religion very, very strongly. And they decided, this is just some, some random people, decided to live their life completely dedicated to their religion. Nothing else in the world is important to them. They're living their life dedicated to religious study and religious prayer. And they formed these things called monasteries. And they also formed convents. And the only difference is a monastery is for men and a convent is for women. But it was a place where a bunch of, let's talk about monasteries. It was a place that a bunch of men could go and live together and their whole lives were only dedicated to God and religion. Same thing with the convent. A whole bunch of women went to live at this one place and their whole lives were dedicated to nothing but God and religion. They studied religion. They worshiped God. Everything they did was just religion, 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 religion. The first monastery was built in Egypt in the 300s. But in the year 529, this guy, Benedict, opened a monastery in Italy. And I'm gonna start a new page. So I'm gonna start over. 529 CE, a guy named Benedict opened a monastery in Italy. And a man that lives in a monastery is called a monk. Life, uh, so Benedict made these really strict rules for all the monks that lived in his monastery. And they were called the Bened Benedictine rules. That space shouldn't be there. It's all one word, Benedictine rules. And the Benedictine rules, the most important one was to obey 
your leaders. And the next one was to work for the good of your community. And the next one was to remain unmarried, not allowed to marry. And the next one was to own nothing individually. Like, let's say I show up at the monastery with my um, backpack and everything I own is in this backpack. The monastery takes the backpack away from me, gives me a robe to change into, and now that's the only thing I own. If I, today in the modern world at monasteries, someone drives their car to the monastery, you don't own the car anymore. The monastery owns the car now. You don't own anything that solely belongs to you. So the Benedictine rules, if you're going to live in Benedict's monastery, you must promise to no matter what, always obey your leader. You must promise that everything that you do is for the good of the community. You must promise that you will never get married and you must promise to not own any private property at all. Now the daily life in a monastery, daily life in a monastery, let's say they wake up at 5 a.m. and they go to prayers. And then at 6 a.m. they have breakfast. And then at 7 a.m. they have more prayers. And then at 8 a.m. they have Bible study. And then at 9 a.m. they have prayers. And then at 10 a.m. let's say they work because they did things like they all lived together. So they made their own clothes, they grew their own food, they made their own pottery. So maybe you went and worked in the, um, the farm, maybe you went and made clothes, whatever you did. Let's say they did that from 10 to 12. 12 o'clock, they ate lunch, one o'clock, they had prayers, two o'clock, they had more Bible study, uh, three o'clock, they had more prayers, four o'clock, they did some more work, five o'clock, they had more prayers, Six o'clock, they had dinner. Seven o'clock, they had more prayers. Eight o'clock, they had more Bible study. And at nine o'clock, they went to bed. And then they woke up the next day and they did the same thing. And then they woke up the next day and they did the same thing. And then they woke up the next day. What do you think they did? The same thing. This was their life. Their life was prayer and study. Study the Bible. Prayer, study, prayer, study, prayer, study, prayer, study. There was some eating in there and there was some working to work for the good of your community. All right, 
there were some other things that were done uh, at monasteries. So medieval Europe, once again, remember society has collapsed in the West. Medieval Europe had no schools, had no uh, hospitals, no libraries, none of that stuff. But the church at the time really, really valued education. And the church had saved as many books as they could when as the Western Roman society was collapsing, the church, these monasteries were collecting books. So they had lots and lots of books and they also provided education for some children. They provided basic medical care. If someone were sick or injured, you could take them to a monastery and they would try their best to take care of them. And they kept these libraries and in the libraries, they had people that their whole job was to copy a book because they didn't really have books. I'm saying book, but they didn't really have books. They had, everything was written on pretty light paper. And what do you guys think would happen to this piece of paper right here if I just let it sit on my desk for a hundred years? Well, hopefully, you know, it would get really brittle and frail and the ink would start to fade. And maybe after 200 years, if I were to touch it, it would just fall apart. And so they took these old writings and very, very carefully rewrote them on new fresh paper so that people wouldn't forget that knowledge. These kinds of things were done at, uh, at monasteries. And they also, all the teaching they did was in Latin. So it kept the Latin language alive because Latin uh, was, wouldn't have really necessarily been too much of a common language. It had been really common. And then Greek turned into the main language of the Roman Empire, but the church kept Latin going. Um, so they sent out missionaries. Let's go back to, so once again, here we are. Most, I'm gonna, let's see, I'm gonna use a different color. Most Christians, oops, most Christians lived just here where I'm coloring in red. This is where the Christians lived. And the church sent out missionaries. A missionary is someone that goes out only to spread the word of their religion and to try to convert and get new people to join your religion. One of those that's really famous is, uh, oops, it, uh, I've moved my, moved my map. Let me go. There we are. Okay. So a famous missionary named St. Patrick. And St. Patrick came from down here in the Christian lands and he went all the way up here to Ireland. I know it doesn't seem like that far, 
But at this time, it would have taken a really, really long time because he would have had to walk. Or I guess he could have come over here and taken a ship up. But this is a long journey. He came up here to Ireland and uh, convinced almost the entire island of Ireland to convert to Christianity. The Pope who lived here in Rome, the Pope sent missionaries to Britain, which is here, and he had pretty good luck because the king of Britain, his wife was already Christian. So the king of Britain's wife was Christian. So when the Pope sent Christian missionaries up here, the king was pretty welcoming of them. He ended up converting himself and by the year 700 CE, almost everyone in Britain was Christian. So now we've got the entire island of Ireland is Christian. Almost everyone in Britain is Christian. And eventually by now, Christianity has spread all over Europe, Western Europe, and Christianity, Christianity has become the center of life for most Europeans. Religion becomes really, really, really important to people. And they just, it's the absolute foundation center of their life is their faith in Christianity. As Christianity spread, it became really, really, really powerful. The church became powerful. The church gains power in Europe. So, it used to be that the government had power over the church. But over hundreds of years, it's changed now to where it's more like the church has power over the government. And that's a really major distinction, whether a king can tell the church what to do or whether the church tells the king what to do. They made the church itself controlled things that were not church related. Like things that secular, maybe you guys know what this word means. Secular means non-religious. You guys go to a secular school. AIS is a secular school. This is not a religious school. You are learning, certainly right now, you're learning a little bit about religion, but that's because this is cultural studies class and religion is tied really closely to culture. But as a whole, we're not a religious school. We don't pray before class. 
We don't go, we don't have a church on campus where we all go to church together. We don't, all, all your teachers are not very, very religious people. We are a secular school. We are not a religious school. And the church became so powerful that they began having power over secular parts of life. So um, just a little bit about the Christians at this time. The Christians at this time believed they should live their lives based on Jesus's teachings. They believed sin was a violation of God's law. A sin is anything bad. And it's you can ask just about anyone what a sin is, and they might tell you slightly different things. A sin is anything that goes against Jesus's teachings. But my opinion of what a sin is versus your mom's opinion of what a sin is might be a little bit different because it's how I interpret Jesus's teachings versus how your mother interprets Jesus's teachings. But still, a sin, they did believe that sin was a violation of God's law. And they believed that how you live your life, how you live your life here on earth, so that's sin, no sin, determines what happens to your soul when you die. Two, there are two possible things that could happen when you die, when your human body dies. Your soul can either go to heaven and live in perfect peace and bliss in community with God and the angels, and you'll be in perfect, perfect harmony for eternity, forever. Or if you sin too much, then you go to hell. And in hell, you are tortured with flames, like burned for an entire eternity. It never stops. Torture for as long as time exists. And at this time that we're talking about in history, this was a strong reality for everyone. People believed this was true, absolute truth. If I sin, I will go to hell and I will be tortured forever. Uh, it was central. It was a central belief of the Christian belief at this time was this idea of heaven and hell and how you live your life today will determine what happens to your soul forever. There are only, there are only three ways to avoid hell. There are three ways to stay out of hell. 
If you don't do these three things, you're going to hell. One, do good deeds. Two, believe in Jesus. Three, participate in the sacraments. What are the sacraments? Sacraments are baptism and communion. Do good deeds. I do good deeds. I'm a good person. Believe in Jesus. Oh, yeah. I'm going to hell. If there's a if there's a hell, if this is real, I'm going to hell. Number three, participate in the sacraments, baptism and communion. Communion, we've talked about this before. Communion is the when people go to church and they they're together with their community and they share a symbolic meal. Everybody eats one little piece of bread. Everybody takes one little sip of wine. It's, it's all a symbol that we're sharing a meal together. But here's a catch. Do you remember when I said how much power the church controlled? Well, the priest, like the, the head of the, the head of the church, your local church, if he were mad at you, he could deny you communion. He could say, no, you're not allowed to have communion. And if you're not allowed to have communion, you're going to hell. And so, I don't know, let's say, let's say here's the church and this is the church's land. And then there's um, this guy named John owns this house. And this is John's land. And the church wants to take some of this land. The church wants this land here. And John says, um, I'm sorry, but no, this is my land. The church can't just have my land. Well, on Sunday, when John goes to church, the priest could deny him communion. If John is denied communion, John is going to hell. And so John, of course, because he's so, so, so afraid of hell, he is going to give the land to the church. This is a simplification of how it worked, but the church leaders used their power to manipulate people and make people do what they wanted because all they had to do was refuse communion. And the people believed so, so deeply that if they did not take communion, they would go to hell. So the, and the religious leaders knew that so they could make people do anything. They could make them do anything. Give me all your money. Give me your land. I know that up until this point in your life, you probably think that all religious people are really good people. They're not. They're, religious people are just like you and me. I am sure you know some really, really, really good people. And I bet you know some really, really horrible people. I bet, don't you ever tell me any names, I don't want to hear them, but I bet 
there are some really, really nice teachers here. Nice teachers that you really like. And I bet there are some really mean teachers that you don't like and you don't want to go to their class because they're mean. Well, it's the exact same thing with bosses at work. Sometimes we have really good bosses that we like. Sometimes we have horrible bosses that we don't like. Well, religious leaders are the same way. There are some truly good, kind, loving, loving religious leaders. And there are also some mean, horrible, corrupt people that are only in that position because they want the power. And there were a lot of those mean, corrupt people in charge of the church at this time. And they used their power to get what they wanted. And um, as, uh, as Christianity spread all around Europe, oh, that looks really messy. Let's, let's erase that. So people want to belong, right? You want to have a group of friends. When you first start out at a new school and you feel kind of, you know, nervous and awkward because you don't know anybody and it's, it's weird. Once you start making friends, you feel better. You like to have a community. And most of the time we bond over things like uh, the kind of music we like. Oh, I like that kind of music too. Or the kind of books we like. Oh, you like that book? I like that book. Or I don't know the sweater you're wearing. Oh, I love that sweater. We, we find these things to bond with each other about. Well, in Europe at this time, their religion bound them together. Even though the culture in Germany was very, very different than the culture in Greece and the culture in Spain was very, very different than the culture in Poland. At least they were all Christians and it made them feel as if they were all part of one large community. And that one large community is called Christendom. Christendom. Blah. Christendom. Oh, that's an M. Christendom is the worldwide community of Christians. If you listening to me, if you are a Christian, then you right now are a member of Christendom. It's the worldwide community and it made people feel part of something bigger than themselves. And we are finished with this lecture. Oh, having trouble. There we go.